to go. Mr. Stegman. Ready when you are. All right, <clears throat> here we go. Flip the switch, we are now live. So good evening and thank you everybody for joining us. My name is Derek Green. I am Director of Community Affairs for Council President Nick Mosby and welcome to our housing town hall, which is the third one in our series of town halls. Uh, we have with us, in addition to Council President Mosby, we have Vice President Councilwoman Green Middleton, and we also have Ms. Lauren Lowry, who is with us from the National League of Cities. And we're going to hear from both of them, but initially and right now, I'm going to turn it over to our Council President. Thank you, Mr. Green, uh, for uh, introducing me. Uh, thank you to everybody for joining tonight. Uh, as Mr. Green said, this is our third of many town halls where we talk about specific issues pertaining to the city of Baltimore, uh, but more importantly, our role as the legislative body here in the city of Baltimore. Uh, we've promised, and, and I think we've delivered uh, this idea of developing a multi-layered approach uh, to addressing the looming issues that have grappled our city for far too long. And we know in the midst of this crisis of COVID-19 uh, that housing security is a major, major problem. That's why this body, the City Council of Baltimore, our first legislative package was specific to the housing crisis. Uh, tonight, we're going to talk about some of those bills. Uh, we're going to talk to um, the head, or I should say the vice president of the City Council, who also runs economic community development where all housing legislation comes through uh, and Sharon Green Middleton. We're going to talk to her about the legislative process. And then we're going to talk to the National League of Cities uh, and Ms. Lowry uh, to kind of cover some of the things not only happening here in Baltimore, but that's happening across the country. So really excited topic tonight because this is a really, really important topic tonight. Uh, it's important for a multitude of reasons. One, uh, when we talk about Baltimore City, about 60% of our residents uh, who are renters here in the city of Baltimore utilize 30% or more of their monthly uh, income to pay for rent. So renting is really, really important here. And you know we're gonna have things in the future to talk about how we move folks from being renters to actual property owners uh, and owning a house. Um, but for right now, when we're talking about this global pandemic, uh, we need to ensure that folks are staying uh, in the sanctity of their own homes and provided uh, the the luxury of having that be stress free while they deal with all of the other issues associated with the pandemic. So again, that's why we really focused on trying to develop a legislative package uh, that was going to support our communities and support our residents. So um, in that package, there were three bills, three major bills. One is the late fees bill. Uh, it basically, it's a late fee extension that provides an extended grace period for tenants to pay their rent. Um, before they incur late fees. It also ensures that people would receive public, uh, public assistance have actually received their benefits before they are required to pay any late fees at all. Uh, we know that that has been a problem uh, in our city. Uh, and, you know, we, you know, as a property owner, we know that when it comes time to pay our mortgage, there's normally like a 15 day grace period. Unfortunately for renters, a lot of times it was just five days. So we kind of split the baby and put it at 10 days, which we thought was really important. Next up is the uh, renter's choice bill. Uh, if you haven't seen it, we're gonna talk about a lot, of, we're gonna talk about this a lot later on in the show, uh, but if you have like listened to the radio, read the newspaper, this has been a really hot button item here in the city of Baltimore. Uh, but basically this is a renter's choice bill that provides renters the opportunity of taking the security deposit. We know that, Paying that security deposit literally is uh, the, the indicator of whether you're going to be able to get an apartment or not, because whether it's $1,500 or $2,000 or $1,000, a lot of times that is really, really a lot of money for someone to come up while they're transient, while they're moving into a new apartment. Uh, so we wanted to develop a way to provide an options uh, for folks to uh, kind of ease that pain. Uh, and for them to get into the apartments that, of their choice, of their desire, for their family and for themselves. So with this bill, it provides an opportunity for folks uh, to either pay out that security deposit over a three month period or do something called a, a surety bond. Uh, where, for instance, if the security deposit was $1,500, the surety, the surety bond would be about $60. Uh, 
meaning that's all you would have to pay. It also provided, it provides additional protections. Uh, many folks in our communities, particularly socially economic disadvantaged communities and black and brown communities, sometimes when they pay that security deposit, they know that they're never getting it back. There's always an issue at the end of the lease that they never get the money back. And there's real, there's really no protections because it's hard to hire a lawyer and go to court and fight to kind of get that, that, that security deposit back. So people just kind of forego it. Well, now under this law, if uh, the secure, if the surety bond is there, it's the onus of the, the property owner to go and prove that whatever damage that was sustained uh, was caused by the renter uh, and that the met amount of money that they're charging is, is sufficient. So uh, this has state protections built into it. Uh, and we're excited about this bill. We're, again, we're gonna talk about some of the misconceptions and some of the, the issues that have been raised to try to, to, try to cut through those things. Uh, but this has been a program that's been functioning in other places and we think it could work right here in the city of Baltimore. And definitely last but not least is just cause. This is a really, really big bill. It's a very complicated bill as it relates to uh, kind of the city's rights um, associated with uh, the way law is codified in the state. Uh, we had a hearing tonight, and we're going to actually go right into our amazing vice president and Sharon Green Middleton to kind of talk about the legislative process, to talk about where we are with just cause, and to kind of move on. So, without further ado, um, I would like to introduce uh, again our amazing uh, Baltimore City uh, Council Vice President and Sharon Green Middleton. Uh, Sharon, uh, if you could talk a little bit about like just cause, the legislation, where we are in the process, uh, and then just organically how the legislative process kind of works for the citizens of Baltimore. Thank you, President Mosby. Um, but if I may, I just quickly like to say some important things, I guess, about me that really leads up to just um, chairing, being the chair of um, uh, your committee and- Our committee. Our committee, yes, it is our committee. And, um, you know, I, I'd like to just start with that. So many people know, and then there's some that don't know that, you know, I'm um, going into my, believe it or not, 14th year on the council, going into my fourth term. And um, can you still hear me? I, yeah, we can hear you. No, we okay. can hear you perfectly. Yeah. Okay. Um, serving on in many capacities, many committees throughout um, many terms on the city council and just proud to be coming off of um, president of the Maryland Association of Counties, which I still sit on that board as a past president. I serve as a board member on the National Association of Counties. So I have been able to connect with many council members and commissioners around the country. And we we share best practices. I we, you know, there's many things we do as council members and we have a, a council connect because of that. And I think it's important because with me, I see a number of the same problems that we experience in our city in other jurisdictions around the country. So saying all that, you know, I want to I thank you so much for having me chair this committee and to start off we um, because of, you know, I'm, I have continued my journey as a council person and representing my district. I have seen so many prop housing problems um, as a, a, a black woman myself. And going out in my, um, you know, leaving my parents' home, I have personally experienced um, a number of these problems that these bills, that from the bills that we have been introducing. And so, my passion and heart, along with my experience, is in this. And I know we um, had a conversation about these housing bills and. Um, just was very um, so glad that we were on the same page and partnered to um, introduce this along with the other two council members that introduced, um, you know, the other two bills. 
All that to say, the legislative process, we have a very fluid and flexible legislative process. And it's, it has always been that way since I've been on the council. We but it's even better with you, with you running that process right now. I appreciate that. It has always been open. We have, um, you know, we've maintained our websites. People can submit things in writing through, through, um, you know, leave a voicemail, an email. I mean, the, the, if there is something that a constituent is interested in, go on our legislar and you can pull down a bill and find out when we're having the hearing. I mean, the process has been open and, you know, you have to take that step and also reach out if you're interested in a bill. Um, we start with, you know, there's a spot. We have sponsors of, uh, you know, the council person comes up with bills based on things that have been going on in their community. You sponsor a bill. We have the legislative rest reference that helps you format the bill. We have on, in your team in the council president's office, we have um, uh, Nikki Thompson, which is uh, uh, the legislative uh, director. We have um, Matt Stegman, we, you know, and then there's a team. We have council services and there's a number of people that are working on that bill and working with the sponsor. There's constant communication. Um, any constituent can communicate with the sponsor of the bill or anyone from that or anyone from your office is going to lend assistance and help them, keeping in mind that the council person, the sponsor of the bill, also has other duties. So it's good to have all these other people in working in that process. Um, after the bill is uh, introduced, uh, these bills were introduced um, shortly after. I think in, in January, right? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. In fact, the bill, the bill that I sponsored was introduced January 11th. Um, the bill that we heard today, um, the Just Cause bill, was introduced on January 25th. So all of them were in, introduced early in January. And then, um, you know, as we're still working on the bill, talking to people, people come to us, as I said, the pro legislative process has, is very fluid and flexible. And um, remember, it's the sponsor of the bill and their goal is to some way get the legislation moving to get passed. We, um, it's introduced and then uh, once it gets through the first reader, we, we schedule a hearing and we talk about the bill. Um, people that are interested in that bill, they can submit testimony. They can um, reach out to the sponsor of the bill and set up a meeting. If the sponsor themselves do not, cannot fit that in their schedule, depending on the time, there's always someone that can set up a meeting and talk to them about the bill. Um, all of these bills, of course, have been through the, the first reader. Um, we are now prepared with just cause that I can use that as an example today. We had um, both written and um, physical testimony and um, agency reports. We always get agency reports. That's very important because the, uh, agencies represent the mayor and the administration. So, you know, we want their feedback. Uh, we make decisions if we need amendments. And if we can't decide and pass that bill at the first hearing, then we schedule a work session. Now, now let's stop. Let's stop right there, Madam Vice President. So, okay. we we know that your passion around um, housing security. Yes, um, and, and that that not only ties to you as a public servant, but it ties to your personal life and the stories mm -hmm. that you kind of have brought up uh, in light. Um, 
talk to us about all of the work that you were kind of able to do prior to you know where we are right now in that legislative process i mean you were working with advocates you were having meetings folks exactly. were part of that process um i think a lot of times when it comes to the end of a bill we kind of forget about all the history about what got us there for the past four months but there was a exactly. tremendous amount of like back and forth as it relates to dealing with advocates, dealing with the community uh, to ensure that everybody was kind of on the same page and everybody at least had a voice in the process. And you would say that that was true for kind of the bill that you sponsored as it relates to this package, correct? Exactly. And, you know, many times we have chairs of committees that's also the sponsor. So it's like, a you know, you're doing a double job in a sense which is um, very, you know, it's important. Um, I, as the sponsor, took on this bill and um, took my time. I, I, it, it was a lot of work that put in that was put into this. Everything that I did has been is uh, basically public. And you got to keep in mind, too, we're doing things virtually. We're not really um, setting up and having one on one meetings. We're doing, we're having our meetings with all of our bills, basically, for the most part, virtually. So, um, which opens us up to, to the general public. Anybody can tune in. You don't have to no longer come into City Hall to watch a meeting. You get to watch it in the comfort of your car or your, your computer. I guess through all of the work that you've done, um, Madam Vice President, I want to keep calling you Sharon. Like what, okay. are some of the, what are some of the statistics and stuff that you brought out that you've saw that you saw that, you know, this is really important for this time, you know, at this particular moment. What are, what are some of the things that 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 you kind of um, have identified that let you know that we're at the right place at the right moment? Well, um, we have had we've been having this problem for a while, and COVID basically has brought out a number of things and just to the forefront even more so. And when they, um, when COVID, you know, was created as a state of emergency, it, you know, things started being a very huge burden, a financial burden on many people. Um, you know, people are losing their jobs. We know that people are, um, uh, probably going to downsize because of that. It's going to be a lot of movement. It already has been a lot of movement. I have experience in my district where land, even though we're, we're, they're trying to tell landlords, please hold on, don't evict anyone. I've had some cases where some people have been, renters have been evicted, um, you know, almost like trying the system. Um, which is which is devastating. Um, I, this, you know, there's been statistics where this city, we have like thirty thousand people that are are renters. Um, it's just, and it's infecting. It's affecting um, our most impoverished neighborhoods even more so. Um, I just see this bill as. It, you know, it's a, it's a gateway and not just this bill, the, the whole package, it's a gateway to uh, obtaining adequate affordable housing. And we on the council have been talking about um, affordable housing over and over and over. And um, this bill that, you know, I know a, a lot about is just, um, I think it's a gateway just to, you know, it's going to help people. It's going no. to help people. And we have these options and um, options are important. Right now, we don't have any options. Things, this is, um, th the way things are now for renters, this renter's choice, there's no choices. And we have to make changes and part of a council person's job is to try to think of ways to help change and make a better life for our constituents. And we put bills in place 
and the and then we can you know try things and we can come let things happen for a year or two years we can come back and and tweak and put in amendments to correct certain things you know, you know, doing... you know madam vice president the thing that i took away from the bill after it matured and we dealt with the advocates and we had one or two like meetings was mm -hmm. this word about renter's choice because renter's choice wasn't always kind of like what we were talking about but that's what i saw because when i kept hearing the stories of like graduate students who had the ability of participating in surety bonds or folks in Howard County or Montgomery County in certain developments that had the ability of, 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 of participating in surety bonds, but that never being available to black and brown communities in a city like Baltimore was really, really interesting to me. And the idea that now we're talking about surety bonds and somehow that be, has become synonymous with this term of predatory type of attacks on black and brown communities was really, really interesting. Um, so I think that, you know, what I've evolved around working with you in this legislation is like, this is really about renter's choice. You still have the ability of going out and paying $1,500 for that security deposit. Exactly. Or, or with your legislation, now you can pay that $1,500 over the course of three months where you're paying $500 a month or with the same legislation, you can get a surety bond and pay $60 with the added protection of the insurance commission from a state perspective that puts the onus on the property owner to ensure that you're covered and you're protected. So, you know, I think that this is really like renter's choice. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's, it, it, it's important for us to educate folks on where we are with it and, and the possibilities we are with it. Um, but mm. that, that becomes really, really exciting. Um, so thank you for well, all your passion and your leadership. You have to say something. I, I, I just want to say, you know, you, you say surety bonds, and I just want to note that, you know, surety bonds are used in, in many different ways. And I continue to say that this is security deposit insurance. This is insurance. It's a type of surety bond. Um, and, and, Again, you can use surety bonds in many different ways. This, this um, is is new legislation, and we want to give it a try. Like we're but, but, creating, but, but, but Council Vice President, it's new legislation, but it's not a new practice. Yes, you know, fo again, folks in Montgomery County, Howard County, and in more affluent, higher socioeconomic classes have been utilizing this practice for a very long time, for decades. Correct. So right. now when we're talking about East and West Baltimore, somehow this automatically becomes predatory. And you know that, that's really interesting. I'm gonna bring into the discussion an amazing uh, person in uh, Ms. Lowry from the National League of Cities. Um, okay. I'm not gonna, um, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna do justice about who you are and what National League of Cities are and all that you, fight for as it relates to all around the country, not just here in Baltimore. Uh, but Ms. Lowry, we want to bring you into this, this discussion right here. Uh, how are you doing tonight? Uh, I'm doing well. Thank you for the invitation tonight. You are doing well. So Ms. Lowry, to the listening audience of Baltimore City, we don't necessarily know what National League of City is or what it does. Mm -hmm. So could you formulate real quickly for us who NLC is and your mm -hmm. role from a, a housing perspective? Yeah, uh, National League of City is the voice of America's cities, towns, and villages. We represent over 19,000 cities, towns, and villages in the United States. I am the uh, program director for housing and community development at National League of City. So my focus is on um, finding best practices and solutions to in homelessness and to uh, in housing instability. So your job, particularly as it relates to this pandemic, and knowing like the uncertainties around housing security has become really, really important. And, um, you know, to be honest, like where you are and all the subject matter expertise you have and where we were four months ago in taking over this office, um, you know, we were really trying to identify, you know, what package we could put together to best put the citizens of Baltimore in the right light associated with housing security. Um, 
Could you talk to us about trends or legislation or things that you've seen around the country um, that 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 have supported communities like Baltimore City residents? Absolutely. So over the last year, there's been a range of legislation and programs that have come out across cities across America, some being emergency rental assistance, um, some being uh, eviction diversion programs. So uh, where a renter is in the process, they can um, go into different programmatic areas. Uh, another being eviction mediation, um, having a mediator to um, to go through a dispute with the landlord or tenant, uh, utility assistance, um, uh, a range of program, tenant protection ordinance, one that comes out of San Jose, uh, similar to Just Cause, uh, where um, if a tenant is evicted, the notice has to go to the city, where a uh, suite of programming uh, that a, a renter could take advantage of, such as rental assistance, such as mediation. Um, in addition to that, uh, landlord and tenant strategy, you know, when talking about landlords and tenants, we're uh, often pitted against one another, be it, is it the landlord, is it the ten a tenant, but it's addressing both those tensions and trying to figure out a strategy that works for everyone. So uh, we worked with the city of Richmond to come up with a landlord and tenant engagement strategy where it was a data uh, driven approach to really get into high risk census areas and then deploy uh, resources that were critical to the renters in those areas. Uh, in addition to that, you know, a lot of cities have been really trying to get to the crux of the eviction crisis that happened long before uh, COVID-19, but really trying to understand the data around it, which has been very hard to capture. So you have cities trying to figure out the data component of it to uh, distribute resources equitably. So those are uh, some of the trends that have been going around the country. And um, also with that, what the COVID pandemic did is help cities to see that uh, you need a toolbox for housing instability, that these programs, they don't just walk away after the crisis, but they're there to help a renter out or a landlord to address issues throughout the process. So, Madam Vice President, I'm going to turn it back to you. I know that you had a tremendous amount of working hours, <laughs> not, not just as it relates to your committee, but specifically about your bill to provide renter's choice. Um, what are some of the things that you've learned from that process? Some of the data points that you've learned, maybe if there's a specific story that you've learned, like, what, what what's something that you've learned through this like very arduous process to get us where we are right now, where we passed the bill out of the council and is currently sitting on the uh, president on the uh, mayor's desk? What what are some things that you've learned from that process? Well, you know, this bill did take time. It was not a, um, a bill that was rushed through. As we mentioned earlier, it started in January and here we are in uh, April, almost now going into May and we're still on this, you know, we're still in the process of this one bill because it's going, it's going to a final step. Um, we still, we just started the process for the just cause bill. Um, we did that first bill early because we knew that that was one of the most important bills to kind of get through, you know, to get through, to get moving. Um, I, there's, I, I've learned that, you know, I, people that want to communicate towards the end, that you, that's something that that person has to do, that outreach. I, I've. I worked hard on this bill with with you and your team and 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 outside people that reached out to me later later on. Um, I participated in a public roundtable. Oh um, yeah, that that became a yes. <laughs> I talk to um, you know we we are elected officials. We talk to communicate and meet 
with with organizations with correct it, you know it's a so, so I, 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 i'm going to address that point real quick uh if you don't mind madam vice president sure, so sure. It, when, when we started talking about this bill when this bill was created there was no organization no company no other entity exactly. that was really involved in it we really looked around the country to try to figure out the best practices the best procedures to kind of create like the bill that we currently have and then from there it kind of went on from there but it's weird because there's there's this connection with one company that offers security bonds that we never had any relationship with that they're one out of other companies that offer security bonds. So I guess from a National League of Cities perspective, have you seen this like voter choice option in other places? We, we constantly talk about Cincinnati, we talk about Atlanta, um, but I guess Ms. Lowry, if you could kind of talk about your experience around um, this um, Richards option uh, type of scenario that we're pushing here in the city of Baltimore. Well, from a national level, uh, we haven't really dipped into that territory. Um, but if you're asking from a perspective, and uh, you could correct me, uh, how we're have asking, you? We're asking from the, you as the subject matter expert in, in housing national. Mm -hmm. Yes, from housing as as it relates to the voice of the community. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, voice of the community. Um, as I've talked to local electeds around the country uh, to really understand the solution that the community needs, um, talking with the community to see if the uh, solution is very viable as well as, and this also comes from my experience working in city government um, and understanding uh, and building trust with the community to ensure that a solution is a very successful, but also when working with the community, um, taking into consideration all sides, both the landlord and the tenant side to really figure out a solution that would be viable to address um, a specific um, issue and understanding that the uh, eviction issue is not just, you know, one component, but there's multiple things that need to be considered. Yeah, totally. Totally. I mean, again, the concern is always about um, the sanctity of where someone rests their head, right? And, you know, when you're dealing with so much uncertainty, when we deal with so much trauma, when we deal with so much stress, you know, being able to literally turn the key, go to a place you want to go and lay down every single night is really, really important. And that's why we looked at like the security deposit alternative bill as such a critical a bill at this particular time, um, just providing that access and an opportunity for folks to really pick and choose where they would, you know, call home. Uh, and mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a lot. Unfortunately, we've seen a, also a lot of um, miscommunication around that bill, um, Madam uh, Vice President, um, as it relates to um, the protections and I guess the predatory aspect of it. I know one big piece of it is now incorporating the state uh, and putting the onus on the property owner, the, the landlord, to prove that this individual. So again, I'm gonna go over the steps. One, you can go in and you can pay $1,500 as your, as your security deposit, or with this bill, you can pay that $1,500 over the course of three months, or with this bill, you can go out and get a, a surety bond, which is $60, um, as it relates to $1,500, and that is money that you will never get back. That's $60, which, which, which basically maps out to about $5 a month. You pay $60, that, 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 that takes the need of that $1,500 security deposit, and then at the end of your lease, if there's issues associated with it, um, the, the onus is now placed on uh, the property owner to go back and say like, hey, you know, Nick Mosby didn't do X, Y, and Z, or he broke X, Y, and Z, and now I need 800 or 900 or all of my $1,500 back. That's where we are right now with this bill. I think the important part is surety bonds is not a new thing to the rental industry. Like, this is not created in Maryland based off of this law, uh, Vice President Green Middleton. This is something that's been in works, particularly for graduate students, 
or particularly for areas of more affluent, more socioeconomics uh, uh, from a higher standard perspective. Now we're allowing citizens of Baltimore access to this. Again, you know, talking about all your research and all of your meetings, you know, was, were these some of the things that you were able to uncover? Um, you know, where's your passion at? Where's your thought process at uh, in regards to, um, to to that and opening it up to the citizens of Baltimore? It's giving the one the main thing that stands out is giving people an opportunity to go into communities that um, they were basically shut out of because of high security deposits. When um, people, particularly people of color, go and look for apartments, we. Um, you know, you have you have to have your money for your first month's rent. You have to have, um, you know, moving costs. Ma Madam you Vice President, I am so sorry. Can I stop you right there? Yes. So yes. In, in the past, in the past, when there was a relationship between the potential uh, landlord and the potential renter, the landlord chose who had access to surety bonds. Let's be very clear. So when Nick Bosby comes into the rental office, either the rental office is providing Nick Bosby the opportunity of paying that whole $1,500 right up front or having access to a surety bond or just telling Nick Mosby, you have to come up with $1,500 security deposit and that's it for you to get access to this apartment. Your bill changes that. So I think it's really important to talk about the paradigm shift of choice of the owner of the property to choice of now the renter. And I think that's where you were going. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I thought that's that okay. Was that's okay. I just want to add that every every agency that was involved in this bill gave glowing reports all the way down to the law department. Every agency gave glowing reports and they're excited about this bill as well. Um, you know, it, it's and that even gave me the push to really um, as a sponsor to really help to get this bill through. The majority of the council understood and approved this bill because of, you know, they it, they also experience things in their districts and this it's it's just um you know it it has to pass it's to me i see this as breaking a, a big barrier for this city we this you know this city has a, it does it has a reputation of racism discrimination and these housing bills are a gateway into um, breaking that mold. And um, I I'm excited about all three of these bills. Yeah, housing sits at the core of structural racism, um, definitely here in the city of Baltimore. When we talk about redlining, we're talking about the ordinance that came out of our council. When we talk about urban revitalization and what that meant for communities and how our neighborhoods currently are shaped today. Um, I guess back to you, um, from an NLC perspective, are there any things you're, or trends or, or policies you're seeing around the country um, that, you know, from a Baltimore perspective, we should be looking at or, you know, we're kind of working down this path, things that we should be doing? Uh, what are you seeing around the country? Uh, the biggest thing is a lot of cities are putting stake in making sure to have a racial equity lens. I know in the work that we do at National League of Cities, when we're looking at best practices and solutions or working with our uh, technical assistance with cities across the country, at the core of what we're doing is we're looking at um, solutions through a racial equity lens and what does that mean when crafting together solutions and what does that mean to the community stakeholders um, who are being impacted so just not putting out solutions to put out solutions but looking at solutions through a racial equity lens as well as 
having a toolbox of solutions for housing for in each of the target audience from homeowners to renters to landlords and property managers that's very important in this uh, crisis taught us how important that is as well as you know looking at shared equity in terms of using community land trusts or cooperatives to ensure uh, how permanent housing affordability that uh, that lasts uh, beyond the affordability period. So, Miss Lowry, when we talk about like you know everything that you just talked about, and I think at the core of it, you know, America is built off of owning property, literally. Right, uh, whether that property is real estate or that property is other things, that's how America was literally founded and where we are today as it relates to wealth. And when we talk about the racial wealth gap, particularly in cities like Baltimore, and that chasm continuing to spread over the course of the past 30 and 40 years, uh, are there any examples out there in the country that you can kind of point to uh, that you think are, I won't say getting it right, because we know that this. I don't care if you point me to the best city, there's a tremendous amount of improvement you could have, um, but have at least started to take steps in the right direction uh, that, you know, us as a city council, us as a city can model ourselves off of. Like, are there any examples that you can point to for us to start looking at? Uh, yeah, uh, a handful. Uh, I'll point out San Jose. They, um, they do anti-displacement work with their housing programs and it is to the point where not only looking through a racial equity lens but in in terms of accessibility to um uh, non-English speaking communities. Um, also, I would highlight Pittsburgh. They're doing great work in eviction mediation. What they did during the uh, pandemic is they looked at the whole playing field of the services that they had available and they looked to find um, where there was duplication and where they needed to really put their money into and they came up with a nonprofit call uh, uh, eviction of uh, Pittsburgh, I believe um, a, another city to highlight. Uh, I have to highlight Norfolk, Virginia, uh, their rent ready Norfolk program, which really has a renter and landlord engagement strategy where the city is working hand in hand. Um, uh, I also would highlight uh, Atlanta and Houston with their community land uh, trust where they're working with their land bank where they're using publicly available land. Uh, to create affordable housing, uh, the list can go on, but those are some that I can um, pause with. And if, if you think about, you know, specifically Baltimore, it should get us really excited uh, because, you know, our biggest challenge is also our, our biggest opportunity and that's land and that's property. I mean, Baltimore's home to tens of thousands of vacant lots as well as properties. Uh, but we're also a huge market that's dependent on from a rental perspective. So granted, today we're talking about housing, but 90%, 95% of the discussion was around rental housing. You know, I think one of the core competencies of my administration is how we can kind of turn renters into property owners, right? Where today someone pays $1,500 or $1,600 in rent, tomorrow they could have a better place in paying a thousand dollars mortgage every single month, right? So, um, you know, we're really interested in trying to, you know, par particularly navigate um, our legacy renters uh, to become homeowners here in the city of Baltimore. Have you seen any like transition from rental market to homeowner market that's kind of worked in other cities around America that um, you think we should start looking at? And I, and I know the uh, the council vice president is taking out notes right now because she's ready for our next big bill. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, off the top of my mind, no. But what I can off the top, not to say that there are not communities out there. I think when it comes to transitioning renters to homeowners, it's really getting to the pain point as to uh, why a renter cannot. So that's looking at the whole system from credit, from looking at um, what type of housing is available. Uh, um, to Down look payment. At, 
yeah, down payment assistance and, and looking at that whole system. I know when I was um, working uh, for the city of Norfolk, my whole thing was how can I transition a renter to a homeowner, but how can I make them the best tenant possible to have that transition to home ownership? So the credit, how to, um, and not really looking at a deficit. I, I think that's to say that renters are at a deficit and they're not because, you know, some are uh, handy with their financials, but the system, the down payment, the credit, uh, how can they maintain their homes and what does that process look like seamlessly, just like we have homeowner homeowner classes, how can we transition rental classes to home ownership classes to have this uh, transition? So that, that's yeah. it. And I think that's really important, um, particularly when we talk about one thing I constantly hit on is like the racial wealth gap. Talk about identifying generational wealth, you know, for particularly communities of color. You know, um, many folks are the first generation homeowners, right? You know, at this time in 2021. Um, and, you know, when we talk about generational wealth, it's really hard to really factor in generational wealth without factoring in the ability of owning property here in America. I don't want to um, monopolize all of the discussion. I know there's probably some questions out there either for myself, yeah. Vice President Middleton, or Ms. Lowry, Lowry from uh, NLC. So I'm going to turn it over to Derek Green. Derek, uh, do you have any questions that our folks would like to yes to we have a ton of questions <laughs> uh, so i want to uh, group a couple of them they're hitting on some of the same themes uh one point of clarity for you mr council president or for vice president green middleton are renters forced to use either a surety bond or any of the other options and you want to take that sharon or you want me to take that uh, and, and and, but the answer is it choices and options, and that's what you have to keep. No, these are added choices. If you want to stick with the traditional way of doing things, you you can do that. These are all just extra tools and options. We just um, got uh, statistics. Um, from the census and uh, particularly from Baltimore that I think approximately 27,000 people we've lost in the city. These are tools and options and ideas to help maintain our population as well. And you, um, Council President, hit on you know the generational wealth and, and all that down the line. This is all important. These are added, I can't say that enough, they're added tools and options, and everyone has a every individual person has their own particular situation, financial situation that they have to deal with, and you pick one of these options to deal with those things. We you we've never had that before. Correct. Correct. I mean, well, the option has been there, but it's been there for the landlord and not for the tenant. Yes. Yeah, because, I mean, I, I never knew about this program. I've had tons of friends and family members that have rented a property, pay the $1,500 or $1,200 up front, comes to the end, you know, this wall is scratched, this wall has a dent, there's a problem there, you get none of the money back, you just kind of move on to your next $1,500 security deposit apartment, and that's it. Uh, in this example, you know, with the security deposit, you can do that, like you said, traditionally, or... You can get a surety bond, or you can pay that fifteen hundred dollars over the course of uh, several months. But it's about providing the real choice and the real option to the actual renter. So, um, you know, my we have another kid, question. All what right, I mean, the folks that have been reaching out to me have been excited about this in the community. So, because you know, it's been something that's never been an option for them to utilize. I'm sorry, just Mr. A, Derek Green. What's the next question? Sorry, just a point of clarity, right on that last point that you made. Uh, someone asked for clarity. Is a shorty bond a one time payment or do they pay every month? If the, if a renter would decide to go with the shorty bond option, is it a one time payment? You referenced uh, a $60. Bond yeah. yeah, would that so, be a no, monthly would, payment you, or a one time? A monthly you would payment pay that, or one you, time? You would pay so, so right now, 
without this law pass, you pay fifteen hundred dollars, right? And and we're paying kind of numbers. It could be sixty three, fifty seven, sixty five, whatever. If you go out and get a surety bond for that fifteen hundred dollars, you're gonna pay that sixty dollars, and that's it. That's gonna cover fifteen hundred dollars bonding capacity associated with your uh, security uh, deposit. So that's all you pay. So when you extrapolate that over the course of that 12 month period, $60, that's kind of like $5 a month, as opposed to again, that $1,500 that you have to pay right up front. Now at the end, what many people will talk about is you don't get the $60 back, correct. And right now for many people, they never get that $1,500 back. So you pay that, you pay it for the bond, you will never get that $60 back, come towards the end of the, the lease, when it's time for you to move on to your next lease, you know, everything is, is, is fine with you and the landlord. There's no issue. You never get that $60 back. You just kind of move on to your next apartment. Now, if that landlord finds that there's damage inside of that apartment, it's going to be on the onus of the landlord to prove that one, you caused the damage and two, how much that damage caused and that will be done through utilizing the insurance commission of the state to figure out where you are with trying to pay that fee. So I yes, think and then to add to add to that, um, Mr. President, they you know when you enter an apartment, you take uh, some people take pictures of the before they enter, and then they take pictures of the after the way they left it. I mean, it. It just you follow just like an insurance. It's up. You have to have that conversation. You're at individual conversation with both parties to figure out your insurance plan. Just and, you know. and, I, and one one question that was raised to me in the past was like, well, insurance has always been predatory to particularly poor African American, black and brown communities, and that's 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 accurate when we look at auto insurance and how much. You know, I pay living in the heart of West Baltimore in comparison to um, a neighbor of mine in North Baltimore. So we understand and we get that. This doesn't have anything to do with premiums, anything to do with insurance. We call it renter's insurance because that's the only way we can co codify to bring in those protections of the insurance commission and everything else. The, the way to practically look at it is as a bond, as a surety bond. Um, but when we look at city and we look at state code, there aren't many examples that kind of tie that into, so it was important to call it a renter's insurance. So this is not the typical insurance model where you're paying on a monthly basis, say for instance, car insurance or even rental insurance as it relates to your apartment. This is this is called insurance, but it's really a surety bond. And that's why we've kind of stuck with talking about it at, from a surety bond perspective here tonight. I just want to, Hit two quick housekeeping items for some questions that have come in right on that point that you just made, Mr. Council President. The Maryland Attorney General has guidelines and guidance that they offer. So there were a couple of questions on who would be the one to provide some of that backstop safety and guidelines for renters and protection. Uh, they can look to the Mar Maryland Attorney General. And their office, they have updated. It's, it's actually the, the Consumer Protection Division of the uh, Maryland, uh, Maryland Attorney uh, General Office. There you go, bringing in your state delegate experience. Thank you, Mr. Council President. And also, someone referenced the City Law Department, and the City Law Department has their uh, feedback and opinion up on the website as it relates to this bill and the information thereof. So. Wanted to put those two things out there. We are drawing close to time. So the, the only thing I'll say is real quick is um, you know, we're definitely excited for you, Sharon, when the Baltimore Sun editorial board did extensive research in this, not only here in the city of Baltimore, but throughout the country. Uh, they came out what I will say uh, a, a glaring approval and uh, recommendation and endorsement of this about how this is right for the city of Baltimore at this particular time. Um, and then we've seen like a lot of national publications that actually brought uh, the Madam Vice President's bill into the limelight in uh, MSNBC, I think did a story and specifically called out your bill, uh, Madam Vice President. So I think we're, we're winding up. We got about five, six minutes left. 
Um, just from a closing remarks perspective from you, Madam Vice President, and then we'll go to you, Ms. Lowry, about just where we are right now in this country, the level of uncertainty as it relates to housing security and kind of the importance of us having this discourse. Um, you know, we don't all have to agree. We're not gonna always get everything right. However, we need to have these discussions and really need to start trying to take those incremental steps uh, as it relates to improving the lives of our residents, because we know at the core of mental health, at the core of stress, at the core of, uh, at the core of anxiety, sits the sanctity of where you lay your head at every single night. And that's where we're fighting to provide folks with uh, a suitable option. So for, from a closing remarks perspective, I'm going to go to you first, uh, Madam Vice uh, President, uh, for any closing remarks. I just want to reiterate again that this is a tool and an option and an added choice. And again, people can go do the traditional way that they've been doing. We on the council are going to be monitoring this bill along with the city. And as I said, we can come back a year or two years and get updates just like we do with with everything else. So. Um, you know, we have to look, we're, we're in the process of looking at everything, not just dealing with housing issues. We have to make changes across the board. And I think this council is putting in innovative things and doing that. So um, um, I feel good about all three pieces of legislation. And um, I think it's gonna be helpful as we move forward and make changes with the city. And it's going to, we're going to be bringing more people back to the city. This is just the beginning step. Well, we thank you for your leadership, your stick to itness, and your ability to work with folks from all across, uh, from the advocates to legislators to the attorney general to everybody else and in between. So thank you so much, um, Vice President Middleton, for all your hard work. And then certainly last, but certainly not least, uh, we have Ms. Ms. Lowry from National League of Cities. Uh, opportunity for you to provide closing remarks for the citizens of Baltimore. Uh, uh, I, one, I look forward to um, uh, your bills uh, being passed, but also um, with the uh, community working hand in hand to to see the vision of Baltimore that they would like to see. So, thank you. Well, that was a really nice political answer. We know you're from a strong. <laughs> government background. Uh, we, again, we thank you all the work that National League of Cities does uh, in supporting us as a council and supporting us as elected officials, but more importantly, in supporting our uh, residents. Um, you know, again, this is the third of many town halls. Uh, we try to think of like really important topics. We know that coming out of COVID, housing security is going to be a major topic as it relates to the growth of our city, but more importantly, the sustainability of our communities and our families. Uh, and that's why we've taken this on as our first legislative package. Um, I think that the level of discourse uh, has been really, really important throughout this entire process. Uh, and I look forward to continue to, again, push these three bills as we look forward, uh, but more importantly, drive and create a city council uh, that's ripe, that's ready, and that's activated to the current concerns and needs of the citizens of Baltimore. So with that said, thank you for tuning in. Again, to this third town hall, look forward to the next, to, to, to the fourth one uh, and many more to come. Uh, but thank you, Baltimore. We absolutely love you. Good night. So, Ms. Lowry, thank you so much for joining us. Now, where are you at, Ms. Lowry? What, what part of the country are you in? I'm Washington, D.C. Oh, you're right in DC. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. We look forward to working.